Hello, and welcome to our final session of the day, everyone. I hope that everyone's had a good day attending the other sessions that have been available in our Spring 2021 Faculty Development Day. I'm Kimmy Johnson. I'm going to be moderating this particular event, um, and I'd like to introduce our two presenters today, Jeff Kaufman and Avius Wunathan. Um, and so today we're going to uh, jump right in, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I hope everyone's able to see all right. So I will be monitoring chat as we go through the presentation today. So our agenda for today is some quick introductions. Uh, we will then have presentations from our two expert instructor presenters, followed by a question and answer session and some conclusions. I will be popping a downloadable uh, list of questions for the Q&A session into the chat as we get closer to that part of the session. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get us started with Jeff. Thanks, Kimmy. Um, just a, a quick introduction, I guess. So I have uh, I have the distinction, I think, of being just a really old guy. Um, I've taught in the uh, School of Public Health for 45 years, part-time as an adjunct, and probably within the School of, of uh, Professional Continuing Education for not sure, Kimmy, how many years, but about the about the amount of time you've been there too. So seven, eight years, something to that effect. And um, I just really enjoy it. I have a great time. My day job is I work for the American Red Cross in biomedical services. And uh, if anybody ever wants to talk to me about uh, the state of Minnesota's COVID response and what we're doing around uh, monoclonal antibodies and vaccinations, I also sit on the the statewide um, vaccination allocation task force. So there's all kinds of weird things that I do in addition to uh, teaching. Teaching I really like a lot. So let's continue to go ahead, Kimmy. So Kimmy asked me to do a, a number of different things and I'm gonna talk about uh, these six things. Just a, a little bit about the assignment, uh, why we do the assignment in the first place, what some of the challenges are in, um, in with the students completing this or, and, and some of the things that they have to deal with. Uh, why I think uh, it makes sense to continue to do this um, semester over semester. Um, Kimmy put together some, some examples of the work that students have produced. One of the things that I would say about this uh, occasionally, and it maybe happens uh, once every other semester, somebody gets so excited about this that they actually end up setting up a company and, uh, and they, they try to implement the idea that they've developed a business plan for. So that's kind of fun. So the, the idea in this class, it's, a, it's sort of an entrepreneurial startup class, is that uh, everybody comes up with an idea for some sort of an imaginary company. Um, and uh, then students uh, submit that, they're voted on by the class. They get to vote for up to four choices and then we just kind of pull all that together. And those that receive the highest number of votes are the ones that, uh, that become the projects for the class. Uh, depending upon the size of the class, you know, we could have anywhere from uh, four or five businesses up to six or seven or eight businesses because I don't like having more than five students work on a plan. Um, they just don't get the, the kind of depth and breadth that they, that they ought to be having in developing these things. Um, then people self-select uh, into the plan of their choice that they want to work on. And occasionally I, we get students that don't select and so I just assign them. But generally speaking, people sign up. Um, I use some software in this class that's provided by Palo Alto Software, and that's made available to the bookstore. The, um, the software is called Live Plan, and what it really does is allow students to do particular parts of a business plan, and then the software helps roll all of that up into one coherent and cogent plan at the end, which is really kind of a nice feature. Not only do they have access to it for the semester, but they have access to it for up to six months. And if they should decide, um, and I'm getting calls here, should they decide that they want to, um, uh, that they want to continue with the subscription, they can do so for a, a pretty limited amount of money. Um, the, the software is available for business and industry, but at a considerably higher amount of, uh, a, a, a larger amount of money. So uh, let's keep going. So the goals of this project throughout the semester, and again, as I said, it's sort of broken up into modules as we go through here, is really for students to be able to, and I'm gonna put it in quotes, test drive 
um, the process of creating a business plan and and uh, and doing it in a way that uh, that's quote imaginary, but at the same time they really get pretty invested in it. Um, it's also to show them that this takes a lot of work, uh, and that there's both science and and art to putting together a business, and uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that go into that, um, as well as a lot of just general hard objective kinds of work. Um, I, the other thing that we do is we, we allow them to create in within their own business, their business roles. So there's a CEO, a CFO, a chief marketing officer, sometimes chief information officer, some of those kinds of things, so that they get a perspective from that lens about what they need to provide to that business plan and the kind of um, uh, pros the process that they need to bring forward uh, occupying that role in the business. And then the other, the last one is to create the business plan, uh, present it, and then allow for critique by the rest of the students and obviously by me for the grade. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's always interesting to see what other students from other plans think about their colleagues and their classmates' plans. There are challenges um, and, uh, and I've tried to compile some of these based on a couple of years worth of experience. Uh, the one of them is is to get students to come up with business ideas that actually have the ability to be implemented. So it can't be some, you know, I'm going to create a spacecraft that goes to Pluto. Uh, you know, it needs to be some sort of a type of business that you can actually create, and that within the semester they have the ability to kind of create that business plan and and uh, and make it make it sort of happen, at least in the in the artificial world. Um, the, uh, sometimes groups have um, issues in trying to create those individual roles and holding each other accountable for the final work product. And that's part of the thing that I brought up a little, a little earlier today that um, students need to hold themselves accountable. And that happens through a series of peer review sessions um, that they undergo and report out to me. Uh, and they actually have quote, $100 to spend uh, on, on how everybody in the group is doing. And uh, Kimmy and I set it up such that nobody can get the same amount of money. So there has to be a prioritization of those dollars, those votes that go to who's doing the best job all the way down to who isn't doing the best job. Uh, many times, and I'm always hopeful for the fact that, uh, that maybe uh, each of the participants is only a couple dollars apart, but occasionally you get the, uh, the end result where uh, four, three or four of the people are very high and one or two people are loaded are rated very low. And then I really asked the group, what are they going to do about that? How are they going to hold each other accountable? And, uh, and they come up with thoughts and ideas and they talk to the individuals. And only in the last, uh, the last straw is, is to bring me in and to use me as faculty to kind of strong arm the people that aren't doing their work. And this really is kind of a self-policing situation. I think it's, it's an important one. The, um, the groups also have to be uh, mindful of the fact that we're not meeting uh, typically on a regular basis, like some of my other classes are scheduled for three hour blocks on Monday or something like that. And they need to find times that are common to them. A lot of these students in this course actually have jobs and they work. And so they've got to find times um, to work together in the evening for the most part. This last semester, I had two students that were foreign based, one in China and one in Europe. So it created some, some insta, uh, interesting kinds of timing things um, for, for those students, which was unfortunate. And then um, sometimes, uh, uh, lastly, I think I need to help students uh, that have some unrealistic expectations or uh, for, for whatever reason they get stuck. Uh, and, and we have faculty hours and or we set up uh, Zoom sessions to talk about those kinds of things. Next, Kim, Jimmy. So uh, why I think this it continues to, to make sense, and it's not that we um, have the same sort of assignment year over year. The Palo Alto software keeps upgrading and, and making their software pro platform better all along, and so that changes. Um, but I, but I think that uh, students uh, at the end of all this see some real um, benefit uh, to creating a business plan and having the competencies to set that up. Um, 
they some of them already work outside. A lot of them already work outside the outside of school, and they may work for some relatively entrepreneurial group, and that's happened many times. And they um, they feel like they have more confidence in going to the leaders of those entrepreneurial businesses, or if they're small businesses, taking on a, an increasingly entrepreneurial role, given the fact that they've developed a business plan. Um, they, they also are, are generally speaking proud of the outcome and they take that kind of knowledge hopefully uh, out into the world. Uh, and, and it's really funny um, and it's really rewarding actually that some of these students end up being uh, close friends and colleagues even in some of the businesses that they wanna set up. As I said, some of these students have actually set up their businesses uh, over the years. I think the software makes the process uh, really enjoyable. Um, it's it's a it's a fun software. It's not only it's not only relatively easy to use, but I think they enjoy using it as well. Uh, and I think you know I'm I'm no guru here. Um, they may learn from my experiences and my mistakes because I've been been involved in a number of different startups, some of which have been really successful and some of which were miserable failures. Uh, but they also get to learn from each other uh, and uh, and the cross pollination of the of the work that goes on inside the class that I think is also helpful. Next. Um, so Kimmy, I'm not sure what you want to do here. This is just uh, just a, a screen or is there some sort of um, uh, video or something you're going to take people to or it's just a, just an example. These are some just brief examples of yeah. FERPA safe materials from your presentation. Okay, sounds good. So what you see here is, is and I, I probably could go into a lot of the detail of each of the modules because each of the modules we sort of we took the the, uh, the live plan software and kind of artificially cut it up into the 14 modules that we have in the class. And so there's a component of the business plan that's each, in, in each of those modules. They do have to come up with mission values, vision for the organization. And there's really extensive financial software as a part of live plan that creates a financial plan, cash flow, uh, p and um, and, and uh, need for capitalization, a whole host of other things. And they go through all of that, as well as going through how do you set up the company legally, what structure makes sense, and those kinds of things. So again, pretty detailed, uh, just a quick example here. And then they post these things, a lot of them post them on YouTube for other people to see too, not just the group. Um, we do have um, peer responses. This is what I was talking a little bit about earlier, that each of the students is, is, act, is asked at the end to critique somebody else's plan. And that information and that critique goes back to the, to the group that has developed the plan. And so again, there's this cross fertilization. You're not just stuck in looking at your own plan, but you're sort of helping other groups along the way and providing thoughts uh, back to those groups. So I think this is might be the final one, um, but but things that I'd pass along to any of you who are thinking about some sort of similar project in your courses, um, and these are these you might consider these a little bit odd, but I but these I've I've run into these these along the way, um, a course like this and in any course and I, I have a little bit of a marketing background doesn't really sell itself. So you've got to work with the program faculty or the, and the program administrative team to get the word out. Um, I've been lucky that I've been able to present um, the format of this class in a couple of other schools within the university. And, and as a result of that, I've gotten some traction with other full-time faculty that, uh, hey, that have said to their students, hey, this looks like a really cool elective. You ought to think about uh, signing up for this class. Um, a big thanks to Kimmy because she's been my course developer throughout here. So smile, Kimmy, even though you're just a picture right now. Um, I think the software that I'm, and this is the second set of software that I've used. I used a different software earlier on and, and that just became a little unwieldy and didn't work very well. So I continued to find uh, companies that would do a better job and, and end up with Palo Alto. I think software makes some of this stuff easier. So rather than recreating the wheel, which I don't want to do, um, they have the, the whole curriculum kind of set up in the software and that, that just makes it a lot easier. And, and they've really gone out of their way, I think, to help me with not only content for the class and they've brought me into other sessions that they hold with other people who quote purchase the software, but they've also set up a really good working relationship with the bookstore, uh, providing additional resources 
and uh, again, allowing me to either talk to their company or attend other lectures that they present occasionally to, to uh, people, vendors who, who, bought, who buy the software. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, this class um, I found needs to fit within kind of a sequence. So people who have developed a, a major or, or who are in business majors, uh, sometimes this works really well for them uh, to be in, the, uh, in their junior year or their senior year because it really kind of pulls together a lot of things. I wouldn't say it's a capstone course, but it tends to take on a little bit of a flavor like that. And then I think lastly, uh, just a commercial for, for ABUS, um, I think sessions like this, faculty meetings and others, very specific meetings that we've had over time, uh, either connect me with other people that are doing similar kinds of things. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I, I, uh, I talk, to, talk to them or uh, create some time to, to be with them to understand what they're doing. And, and maybe we can play off each other a little bit, uh, but it's always been useful for me to, uh, to be in those meetings and to talk with other faculty about the exercises, class elements, et cetera, and even, even things that we learned today in the session. So, uh, Kimmy, you've been monitoring the, uh, the chat. Let's want to go to that one. We do have a question from Shirley. Uh, she's asked if the assignment is uh, an assignment in the class or is it the, really the whole class itself? Yeah, it's um, not the whole class. Um, it's, it's about I don't know, Kimmy, what do you think? It's probably about 60% of the grade, somewhere 50, 60% of the grade. I think it's um, about 55-ish. Yeah, and there are there are other assignments along the way, other readings along the way, uh, other things that they need to do, including um, understanding their own uh, particular penchant for for becoming an entrepreneur. And we, I have, we have them go through a number of different assessments that assesses their degree of creativity, their, their, uh, their acceptance of risk, and a whole host of other things. Um, we put them through some leadership uh, types of, um, of uh, survey work. Uh, they have to go out and find an entrepreneur and interview that individual. And uh, there are a number of set questions, plus they have to develop their own set of questions when doing that. So um, this is just one component. It's the major component, but there are a lot of other assignments in the class as well. Uh, Kimmy, I think it's a level three course, right? So it's. Um, so it so it has those kind of requirements that it's pretty uh, pretty rigorous. The four thousand level course. Okay, four thousand. So I'm going to briefly stop sharing and then reshare because we have audio with Avi's presentation. Um, but Avi, I'll let you go ahead and start uh, introducing yourself as I begin that. Uh, thanks hey, for driving thank you. me. And thanks, Jeff. That was uh, great to hear about your presentation. Um, my name, so you see it's Avinash Vishwanath and I typically go by Avi. Um, and the class that I teach is or have taught is uh, facilitating community-driven leadership. I always have to remember the, the words in the right order. Um, and it's part of the uh, CCAP's uh, civic engagement program. And the facilitating community driven leadership really is about uh, working with students to help them understand what leadership looks like in different communities and what it means to different communities and how those communities define leaders and leadership. And in that course, uh, I taught that course in the summer of 2020 and then the fall of 2020. Uh, with the support of Kimmy, we were planning that course to be online before the pandemic hit, which was really wonderful. So we were kind of in in that process and didn't have to make any major adjustments, but um, I'll get into a couple of things that that, that uh, kind of, um, what, how that impacted what our, our uh, project was and how the students interacted with it. So just to get into what the project was itself, um, throughout the semester, the students created a podcast, a singular podcast episode that was an interview with a community leader. So throughout the semester, they learned about community-driven leadership. Um, and again, you know, what defines communities, how communities determine their own leaders. And then the students had to identify a community leader to interview and to learn from. Uh, they did some research into this leader, into their community, into their organization, if they were affiliated with one, um, created a, a set of questions that they wanted to ask um, you know, some things that they wanted to learn and then ultimately conducted the interview. Um, and that was the, that was the components, that, the learning components of the interview. Um, in addition, because it was a podcast, the 
students also essentially learned how to create a podcast. And so they had to record audio samples, work on editing uh, and add music. Uh, there was a lot of technical support available for students. We had a set of uh, instructions. The audio sampling was done through a software called Audacity. Um, there was some, um, uh, some music um, sources that were provided to them, but the technical components and learning about how to create the podcast was part of the project as well. Should go to the next slide, thanks. So the goal of the projects, again, really to deepen the understanding of leadership. Uh, you know, when we talk about communities and defining communities and how communities define leaders, those, those things can seem at times uh, somewhat nebulous. They shift from community to community. Uh, cultures are different, leadership hierarchy or um, you know, familial structures. Those are different things that, that fit into communities and they can be, they differ so much. Uh, and so one of the things that we really wanted to do was help students get grounded in, in sort of the application of those by meeting with actual community leaders. So that we wanted them to learn from those leaders. What, were, what was their journey into leadership? What did it look like for them to grow into a leader into their communities? Uh, and what does it mean now to continue to relate to those communities? How do leaders represent those communities? Um, and I should just say that when we're talking about community-driven leaders, we're really distinguishing from um, some like appointed or elected officials or something that was created by a structure outside of the community and really looking at how do people develop as leaders within their own communities. Um, and we'll have a, an audio sample a little bit later, but you know, there was a student who interviewed um, a couple of people who had individual who were individuals with disabilities, and that was the community that she was exploring. And so she went to people who have uh, real life connections to to what the community is, instead of thinking um, broadly or um, in terms of other structures. It was people who developed and had, you know, as I use that that phrase, journey had that journey within their own communities. And then again, there were the technical skills that we hope that students uh, picked up and can carry forward in other parts of their work as well. Um, you know, I mentioned the, um, the audio sampling and the editing. Uh, so that was one piece with that podcast. Uh, there's also uh, presenting information in new ways. That was actually one of the reasons that we came up with this. And, and it was really Kimmy who um, suggested it initially. And uh, that was really to think about creative ways to present information um, and stories that people are learning. And then the interview itself was about facilitating conversations and to create a dialogue with, uh, with the individual and with the leader. And so one of the, the things that students were practicing really is their ability to carry forward that type of conversation. All right, so uh, I was looking over the slide as I was planning um, you know what to say or coming into it and I was like oh my god look at that I wrote logistics twice I need to go back and fix that and then it occurred to me that that was fully intentional on my part um, you know one of the biggest issues in this really is was logistics I just want to you know name right up front that um, connecting with interview with the interviewees um, connecting and scheduling and actually conducting what was definitely a, a, a challenge for students and particularly in the um, pandemic time, but one of the things that was really important and a lesson for the students in this process was that because the leaders that they were interviewing are so embedded in their community, sometimes people were um, addressing immediate needs in their community, supporting people during challenging times, whether it was, again, the pandemic or um, the, uh, the uprising in the summer, in the early part of the summer, um, you know, whatever issues were coming up, community leaders were, were working. Um, they that's you know being leaders is part of what their lives were like and so those logistical challenges that came with scheduling and came with uh, conducting the interviews really were often an, an opportunity to learn about how community leaders do interact with their communities um, and how those leaders may have to address or be flexible or adaptable in given moments um, you know with the technical learning that's happening at the same time, there were technical issues that came up, but everything was really, we were able to work through it with support from staff um, and, and, you know, everything again is, is just part of that learning process, but, um, you know, logistics are always a thing and I'll come back to a couple recommendations or thoughts on how best to work through those uh, a little bit later. All right. So some of the benefits, you know, I talked a little bit before about how some of the concepts around communities and leadership can be uh, 
are, are not always clearly defined uh, and, and shift and move around. And so one of the, the key pieces about this, again, and the impacts is to see some more concrete concepts of what leadership and communities look like. And fundamental com to communities are relationships. Um, relationships, how people connect with one another. Part of that is around trust. Uh, and so building relationships and building trust with an individual and hearing how individuals build relationships within their communities was a really important lesson that students were able to see and participate in themselves. Um, and the next three pieces, again, facilitation, that concept of um, working through and caring for a conversation with the idea of learning and that last that last bullet point there with um, learning from this individual and ensuring that you're listening to what their stories are. Um, that, that just the practice of that is something that uh, and again, you know, it differs from community to community and how a person might communicate. And so being able to learn how to practice that in, in these moments was really important. Um, you know, it's really about deepening the practice of the concepts that the students learn throughout the class and hopefully they can carry those relationships forward. Uh, you know, I wrote in here too that the selfishly, the conversations were really inspiring for me to be able to listen. And I think for some of the students who listened to their peers, I left that part out, I apologize, but the peers, um, students had to listen to two of their fellow students podcasts and um, provide thoughts and comments on them. Um, and I, I think that the students really found that rewarding as well and, and the learning opportunity and inspiring. And a point that I didn't actually put on here, but I was thinking about too, is that um, I'm hopeful that some of the people who were interviewed also found this uh, an experience that um, benefited them in some way, that we weren't just sort of taking information from those leaders and the questions and the way that it was communicated to those leaders was not um, in an extractive way, it was really trying to be relational. And I hope that they um, all found something that benefited them in that conversation, whether it was just an experience talking about their work and sharing their stories or something that they can carry forward with them as well. All right, here's the example. Uh, just as a heads up, the example's a little bit quiet, so you may need to turn up your volume for a few seconds and then turn it back down. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to my first ever podcast. I'm calling the podcast Conversations from Red Wing in the hopes that maybe this venue will be an opportunity to share untold stories that just might help all of us better understand one another and our community. For this podcast, I'm speaking with Nicole Buck, an activist and member of the Prairie Island Indian community. We had an opportunity to have a conversation on the warm, beautiful November afternoon following the 2020 general election. Nicole was sitting in front of a And that's the end of the, the clip. <laughs> uh, I forgot to lower my volume in my headphones before you spoke, Kim. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for that warning before, though. Um, here's a couple of examples of peer responses. Uh, in the, the students, when listening to the podcast, were um, asked to think about what their takeaways were. Um, how do they, they feel about, you know, some questions about the work. I think one of the questions there is what was the biggest hurdle in the work of the leader? Um, it was, again, having students dig deeper into what they were hearing and reflecting upon it. So these were facilitation questions to guide them and how they were thinking about, uh, how they were thinking about others' podcasts. Um, I did see John's question in there because this is actually an important point to this as well. So I just wanted to go back and answer that. The question was, what techniques do you use to make sure they're moving through the exercise at a pay at pace and not trying to accomplish the entire thing in the last week? Uh, the assignment, overall assignment was split into, um, I can come up with it. I think it was six different chunks. Um, the first part was around an initial, so there was an initial audio recording. There was part about um, the research into the leader, identifying the leader, research into the leader. Um, scheduling the interview was actually one piece of the assignment. The interview protocol was one part, and then the, um, the final interview was another piece. So they were, they were spread out throughout the semester. Um, and there was a due date for the podcast, which was 
um, at least a week, if not two weeks before the class ended. I don't remember the exact timeline, but enough time with enough time to give students the opportunity to listen to their peers podcast and to respond to them. Um, so everything was paced out so that they had the opportunity at the end. Um, and I should say too that this assignment, just a, um, something that Jeff had mentioned too, this assignment was about a third of the grade for, uh, for students. Um, there was ongoing discussion uh, questions and conversations happening throughout the semester. And there was also a reflection, uh, an individual reflection journal that students kept. Um, and sometimes those reflection journals actually were uh, reflected upon what students were doing relative to this. So there's uh, multiple pieces that were kind of paralleling, but specifically, John, it was broken up into a number of different assignments that were due throughout. And I should, each assignment was weighted a little differently. The podcast was the bulk of the actual podcast was actually the bulk of the last um, of, of that part of the assignment. And so John has asked whether anyone has used the peer review function that's embedded within Canvas um, on any of these parts. And I don't believe that's either of you did. Well, we use peer review, but it's not necessarily maybe what's built into Canvas. Kim, Kimmy, I think we constructed that, right? Yes, there, there are two general ways to perform a peer review. One is using Canvas functionality, which is somewhat restrictive when it comes to timing, but it is a, it's a good function and it gives the students the ability to use the speed grader to comment on each other's work. And then sometimes you just set up a discussion in order to have a small group peer review or individual peer-to-peer uh, -peer review. And that's what we did in this was the discussion option for responding to the peers. Just on the last slide, just a couple of recommendations. You know, I was reflecting on those challenges and one of the biggest uh, pieces again with the scheduling interviews. I think it would be great to have students, if doing something similar to this, to identify more than one person to interview and have other options. One of the pieces that um, didn't come up till the end was that students were thinking about the leaders that they interviewed and the parallels to the leaders that their peers interviewed. Um, and that came up a little bit throughout the course, but it was really much more present in, at the end. And I was um, reflecting that that starting that explicit conversation earlier about thinking about different leaders and researching would both help them understand what leadership looks like in different communities and would actually potentially help with some of the logistical issues. I mean, the, in the worst case, um, there was a student who I connected them with somebody based off their interest, like maybe three weeks before the end. And so some of their earlier work wasn't quite as relevant. Um, pieces were, but uh, you know, I mean, it, it I helped them guide them into this space. But if they're doing more um, thinking a little bit deeper about it or broader early on, that might help. Uh, you know, and I had a couple of students who were, I think in some ways, they were really challenged by the pot, the idea of the podcast. It was hard, hard for them to identify. And actually the student who, um, the example that you heard was one of those students who uh, multiple times throughout was like, I just don't know what this is gonna look like. I don't know how this is gonna come out. And um, and I think they did, they did a wonderful job with their podcast, but it just took some time in helping them envision. And so examples of um, what the end result looks like or could be, we did have a couple of examples, but, but honestly, they were more, <laughs> they're fairly well polished um, relative to what uh, some of the students, um, some of the students did. I should just name too that I'm a big David Tennant fan, Doctor Who fan, and David Tennant does a podcast that's, David Tennant does a podcast with, and then he interviews somebody, and I actually directed that particular student to his podcast so she could see how he does um, interviews. But that was, uh, that just examples like that I think are really helpful. And then the, the technical support, this couldn't have been done without that. And um, without that support, without Kimmy, without um, Greg who helps uh, with all the technical aspects, without them, this, I never would have been able to do this. They were helpful in educating me in this process as well. Okay, so we had originally planned to do small breakout rooms, um, but it actually seems that we're a small enough group that we can stay here as a whole group and discuss together. So I'm still going to uh, ask you to think about the same questions, but uh, consider this an open session to talk about your ideas for a project you've always wanted to do or how you think an extended project might fit into your course. Uh, think about what the stakes are for that kind of project. Um, and what might you need for support or what questions do you have surrounding your idea? 
Um, so I'll go ahead and open the floor to anyone who wants to ask questions and feel free to unmute yourself to ask your question or you can ask it in chat. And we'll just give everyone 30 seconds to think of their questions. <laughs> So I'll go ahead and get us a little bit uh, started expanding on something that Avi was talking about, which is um, for the podcast. When asking the students to structure this, this really became an adventure in both uh, critical thought and interviewing thought. So those podcasts were interspersed with interview segments. Um, but outside of those interview segments, the students were extrapolating and uh, critically thinking about what they'd heard, as well as comparing it to the content within the course itself. Um, so those projects really were a, a summation of everything that they'd taken in in the course. Um, and they'd been thinking about them from the beginning. So they were able to start weaving in bits of course material from the very beginning of the project. And Jeff, you do something very similar in your project with scaffolding it the way we do. Um, right. Students are thinking about their business and how they want to work with their business pretty much from the very beginning. Right, and each of the modules kind of takes a chunk of that. And then it, it, it really sort of, uh, the integration of that comes together at the very end. And that's where the software I think is pretty helpful. Are there any other questions for our presenters uh, just about the projects themselves or their implementation or successes or failures or roadblocks? Um, Jeff, can we, um, Avi, I have a question, it's Michelle. Um, so first off, I want to say this has been really, really interesting. So thank you both for sharing um, and Kimmy for facilitating. Um, as I'm listening, um, I'm just kind of processing a little bit and I think um, both of your courses seem really nice and complimentary, um, both kind of looking at um, the students' particular goals in different ways. So um, I was also kind of thinking about, do you have any backup plans or um, other ways to keep students accountable? Um, should the software fall through for your course, Jeff, or some of the business plans? Because I know you talked about the um, kind of scoring mechanism and the $100. Um, and it just, but wondering if there are students who, short of failing the class um, through mechanical reasons or what have you, um, might otherwise not succeed. And Avi, kind of same question, but also wondering like, what do you do in the case of a student can't get their podcast together, can't you know connect with their community leader? Um, are there ways to still hold those um, course objectives account or still hold the students accountable to those course objectives? Like, do you have any um, thoughts on how you might work around that, or is that just a straight, you know, you don't quite meet the the needs of the course? Yeah, Michelle, I'll give you one example from this semester. Um, I had a student who. Um, in addition to taking, I think, five courses at the university, had three part-time jobs and um, was struggling to, to keep up in the class. And there were, there were he just wasn't available all that often. And um, he was identified relatively early on by his group of not being very participative and you know coming in at the last minute with thoughts or ideas or his, his part of the assignment for the group. And so um, I, I, I uh, contacted him directly and I said, you, you know, you probably bit off more than you can chew here. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you can easily drop the class if you want or drop other courses or scale back your work or whatever, but, you know, you're, you're having some trouble managing all of this. And uh, he didn't really want to do that. He was, you know, very determined to be able to manage everything in his life, which was not easy. And at the very end, um, he ended up uh, doing a reasonably good job with his team on the projects, but he let a lot of the, the, the other tangential assignments slide. And, um, and I said, uh, you know, I, I actually gave him an F in the class, which really motivated him. And um, he, he got back to me immediately and he said, is there any way, you know, given my situation, plus he also had a mom who got COVID and he had to take care of her. 
Um, he said, is there any way that I can get an incomplete and then we can work on a plan to finish the rest of the, uh, the assignments? And so I don't know if you've ever been through that process before, but I did give him an incomplete. The university contacts the faculty. You work out a plan with a student and, uh, and he's on task right now because we've sort of worked together on this to make sure that he finishes all of his assignments by the end of January. So um, no, I've not run into technical issues or problems. Um, the one thing that I ran into before with the former software, which is kind of interesting, is that it worked on a PC, but it didn't work on Apple. And so there were a lot of students who, you know, we had to kind of, and it was a pain. We had to recreate the stuff and, and, and uh, you know, kind of spoon feed it out and kind of a copy paste methodology, which wasn't fun. And so I ditched that software and went with Palo Alto, which works on any kind of format. So that was the only technical issue I had. I haven't had any issues since, but there are, from time to time, there are student issues. Uh, I'll just take it technical first. We didn't have any technical issues that weren't um, able to be solved or resolved relatively quickly. So um, that was good. Uh, I did have a student who, um, who the person they were going to interview sort of canceled at the very end, and it was um, a pretty rough situation. So we, I, you know, had, came up with a couple of options for the student, but because it was so close to the end of the semester um, and incomplete and trying to reschedule, it was just not something that I thought we could rely on. Um, and be confident in. So what we worked out was that the student just recorded uh, essentially um, themselves speaking and presenting on their information that they, the things that they had learned and um, what they wish they could have learned. And it, it worked out pretty well. Um, you know, I think it was a little disappointing for the student and there was definitely, um, I think more than anything, it was just working through the emotions that they felt from their work uh, that they had put into it, not really being fully you know, not being able to complete what they had been working on for you know, 13 weeks or so at that point. So that was definitely a challenge for them, but we got creative. Um, and like I said, I worked with another student in the summer who also had a similar issue. It was a little bit earlier in the semester. So we were able to figure out um, how to pivot, but you know, I worked with him through his different assignments about what he wanted to learn, what he identified and was able to um, find somebody, actually knew somebody who worked kind of in a similar field. So I was able to connect in with somebody else. And I, I made sure that the students in the second semester knew that too, that like if they needed support or help in finding somebody, um, that's a role that I'd be more than happy to play in supporting them if, if that needed to happen. But with the one student, we did have to you know, modify what the project really was at the end. But I mean, I think it worked out well, um, well, <laughs> well enough, but, uh, and I, I believe the student felt good about it too. Yeah, maybe just a quick comment on what Avi said. Um, the our interview with an entrepreneur is it's broken up into a couple of different modules so they have to figure out who the heck they want to interview they need to set that up in a time frame and i know i've had some issues with you know some the student had an issue with trying to get that done uh, then they have to develop the question questionnaire set that they're going to actually ask them and then the assignment is completed probably by about module 10 so there's still another at least month you know, if there's some sort of slop or it didn't work out or they had trouble or they had to reschedule or something. So it's, it doesn't all end up sort of at the end. There's time to kind of make up for the fact that there could be some slips along the way. And Michelle, I'll also chime in in um, a different class where we had students doing video lectures, critically analyzing a primary source. We have encountered disability issues and accessibility issues in the past. Um, and that's really the one of the purposes our unit serves is you, if you find out you have a student with a disability who can't complete one of the, the projects, we'll help you find an alternate project. Uh, in the end, we ended up creating um, a virtual museum kiosk project where students create a virtual museum kiosk using Google Sites. And that's actually become one of our standard projects uh, moving forward because it ended up really working for the hearing impaired student who couldn't do the presentation. So basically when you run into trouble, please come to us. We're happy to help. Um, another comment to Kimmy on that one too. I had a visually impaired student uh, and then I, I can't remember actually who I worked with, but I think Kimmy was aware of it. Um, we created a way for the student to have, I mean, she could read, but maybe like two words on the screen at a time. And so she was able to use that technology available through the IT group at the U uh, to be able to just literally scroll through 
and she was probably she probably sat about three inches away from her screen. Um, I was able to meet with her a couple of times during the course, and she ended up being one of the leaders in her group. She was just amazing. I have a question. Um, so, um, I, and I'll just say as an aside, Kimmy's helped me with, I, I haven't taught a class yet. I've got one starting in a few days and, and Kimmy helped me kind of do a semester long project as well. Um, but one of the things I was wondering, Jeff and Avi, if you have any perspective or Kimmy or anyone else, um, is I know other, you know, in-person classes may have a semester long project. Do you see particular issues, um, challenges, pluses because the classes are online? Um, does that help hinder? Are there things that we should be looking out for, or be aware of if we're thinking of a semester long project? Yeah, one of the challenges that I've seen um, in doing, in, in having the asynchronous kind of a class is the ability of students to find common times to meet as a group. And when we're in the classroom, um, we can always carve out time for student groups to get together and spend some time, you know, working on that particular module or just connecting and, and figuring out when they're going to actually meet outside of class as well. So it's a little more difficult than the asynchronous world simply because it's sometimes hard to find common meeting times. I, I would say that was, oh, was I, I wanted to mention that one of the resources if you have someone with a disability is reaching out to the Disability Resource Center. Um, ATD, we can help with some um, like technological things, but there isn't really a replacement for the student and you working with the um, DRC. Um, so I, I'm just gonna place a link here for who, um, them. And Sorry. we will work with the DRC with you. So basically you triangulate us in, we'll communicate directly with the DRC uh, to make sure videos get captioned, et cetera. Um, but it was through the DRC communicating the students' needs that we knew that we needed to change a project. So getting right. that information early is super important. I apologize I for the interruption. Oh, no, thank you for that. Uh, I just wanted to add to that from my perspective, I mean, the work wasn't a group project, but, you know, I mentioned a little bit about the scheduling, which was challenging because students couldn't do the interviews in person. So that was, that created a little bit of a, um, I think in some moments, maybe some logistical problems, but people were able to work through um, through all that. Um, it's hard when you don't have, I think it, it can be challenging sometimes when you don't have regular check-in points, like everything, all the communications via email and you're trying to get back and forth. And so if we were able to see each other once a week or something like that, you know, then there would be those uh, opportunities to interact. And I do think that there are some adjustments with the students and myself to making sure that we were communicating with each other regularly when there were issues. Um, I would just also add to that, you know, the students were all uh, working or, or, you know, days are busy. And so there's only certain times that people could communicate, you know, or writing emails in the evening. So those things um, created a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a challenge. I just, I think for myself, one of the things that I just tried to do was anytime there was an issue that looked like email wasn't the best way to communicate or like a quick chat would be better. I set up times to check in with the students um, just to be able to, even if it was just a 10 minute conversation, just so we could talk through what the issues were. Uh, and that was one of the ways that I kind of worked to resolve some of those communication problems. Yeah, one other thing too, um... If I found that the issue was common to more than maybe several students, I, I, you can deal with that in a couple of different ways. One is to address it in the announcements, and I kind of use that for that purpose. Uh, but the other one is that you can actually do is, is um, do a Cultura video and post that within each of the modules. And then that can also serve as an ability to, to help the rest of the group if they were having you know, sort of common problems. Um, I think that Jeff and, and Avi's uh, comments really are the instructor, even though our asynchronous courses are set up to basically run themselves, the instructor's input and, and concentration on the project is really invaluable and, and really determines the success or failure of a project. When the instructors are there, uh, they're available to be spoken to, they help you get the help you need. 
um, we tend to have highly successful projects. So I think that's a big part of it. The other big part is we spread these projects out. We know that they're large. We introduce them in the first or second week of course, generally. Um, that way students have time to think about them and those mini assignments, the six part, seven part assignment are, um, they serve to prevent most of the procrastination. It's not universal, but it, it helps. So we are down to about our last 10 minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and since we've changed the way we're doing things a little bit, speed through some of these last slides um, and just get to our closing slide. I will of course stay on and everyone else will stay on if you have more questions or you just wanna chat. Um, but basically if you have more questions about Jeff or Avi's individual presentations, they're happy to have you reach out to them by email. And if you're interested in creating an extended project of your own or retooling an existing project in one of your courses, talk to your program director and they can start a request with academic technology and design. And a designer will reach out to you and we'll get started on actually redesigning that project for you. Um, of course, we also want to hear about your experience with the presentation and with the information conveyed within. Uh, so please make sure to evaluate your experience on the Faculty Day January 2021 Canvas site. Um, and Paul will be uploading a link into the chat shortly that leads you to a survey about your experience. And there are two surveys, I believe, one on your individual session experience and one on your overall experience with Faculty Development Day. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for taking the time uh, late in the afternoon to attend and to listen to us talk about the things we're passionate about. And we'll stay on for a little while longer if anyone has more questions.